Students, welcome back to part two of chapter 16 in your humanities textbook. Of course, this is Humanities 232, Southwestern Christian College. I'm your instructor, Dr. Barry Graham. We'll continue with neoclassical art. Neoclassical art embodies escapism versus idealism. Remember that they're going back to this more Greco-Roman classical way of depicting art to find an idealism. Uh, and this is in response to much that's going on in the culture. Many of these things were already, uh, we've already talked about the clash between the divine right of kings and the new democracies, constitutional republics, new political ideas. And so we'll continue to see this in the works of William Hogarth. We'll refer you to the textbook for more and more of his works. But like many of these other artists and even writers later on that we'll mention, they, invo they, uh, they really embodied and involved themselves in a certain satirical style, using humor to make a point. Uh, so a satirical moral subject in much of the work. In the, there's much of a, uh, of a sculptural quality in the artwork. It looks almost like sculptures frozen in time, and they're using classical models of architecture as well. Uh, austere public buildings. Uh, we see this in Thomas Jefferson's state capitol. We'll go forward here and we can see it. And again, this is very common today. If we want to evoke a certain feeling or mood in people in, uh, in this type of architecture, this is why they'll make banks to look this way. The, the banks, therefore, are a safe place to keep your money. Uh, also, our state capitals, as in this one and in Washington, D.C., the buildings are designed like this so as to inspire confidence in the elected officials because it's such a dignified style. We'll now transition to classical music, the same kinds of things that we've been talking about in this neoclassical style in the visual arts will also apply to music, especially as exemplified in the style gallant or the gallant style. One of the first places that we see this is in this uh, German term here, the Empfeinsomkeit. In one of jo Johann Sebastian Bach's son, C.P.E. Bach, they abbreviate uh, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, they abbreviate his name. Of all of Bach's many sons, he was the only one that uh, seemed to uh, come to any measure of fame. And so it's in his music, the general versus the technical definitions. It results basically in a brand new musical idiom. And again, it's involved with the emotion, the intellect, but trying to balance the two and bring some kind of order into it. The sonata form that we could mention here certainly comes into play as well. So this kind of German word here, meaning sensitive or sentimentality, this style of music expressed the feelings of the actual composers. And so you have this real rhapsodic melody, uh, very much a homophonic texture, a one sound. And uh, so that's very, very indicative of the classical style. We'll also look now at the classical symphony. Many times when we think of the symphony orchestra, we strictly think of it as quote-unquote classical music. That's really incorrect. Remember that the classical period of music just deals with one period of music history, and symphony orchestras can play music from a lot of different musical eras. Uh, the Baroque era, the Renaissance, the classical, the romantic, modern day, uh, whatever uh, you might choose. But Classical just kind of seems to be the term that uh, that that's fixates in people's minds. But it is during this time, it is important 
that orchestral standardization came into play. The way you see not only the style of the music in terms of the symphonic movements, the first movement, the second movement, third movement, fourth movement, etc. Um, also a standardization in terms of the way the instruments are set up on stage. And there's a good chart in chapter 16 in your textbook that you can refer to for that. We mentioned the sonata form earlier as well as the, uh, and we want to mention the sonata allegro form as well. This is a three-part structure of the music that gives it uh, ideally uh, something that composers work with uh, back then and even work with even to this very day. If you want to write a hit song, you write it in the sonata form. Uh, it's a three-part uh, uh, type of music, which means basically you've got a beginning, you've got a middle, and you've got an end. Now, the fancy words that they would use is exposition, development, and recapitulation. And what this means is, is that they're introducing a musical idea, they're developing it in the middle, and then they're basically going back to that original theme here at the end. That's what that's why they call it recapitulation. You may have heard the term recap. If we're going to do a recap on something, we're going to go back and summarize it. This is what they're doing, and this is the way most of our music is written even to this day. It always cont contains a slow uh, lyrical movement, or the third movement can be a minuet, which would have more of a three feel to it than a, than a, a basic four beats to the measure, as we would think of most music today. And the end, a spirited, cheerful conclusion where the music really picks up and they go for the big finish and it leaves everybody very satisfied. There are many examples of this. I've put some of them on the Schoology site in chapter, uh, following chapter 16 presentation and be sure to check those out, especially the ones dealing with uh, Haydn and Mozart. And those are the two we'll look at here. Franz Joseph Haydn is considered the father of the symphony. He pioneered this particular musical form, and he wrote over a hundred symphonies, if you can believe that. Um, this comes during a time uh, that there's a great deal of reverence for the artist and society. Remember, up to this time, many people are still looking at musicians and composers as just hired hands. But now we begin to see the virtuoso, the, the great composer held in very high esteem. Also, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the most famous uh, composers and musicians of all time, uh, even at the age of tender age of five years old, he's tu he's touring all over Europe and playing uh, the newly created uh, piano and playing all of this virtuoso music and he's composing it. And you might be thinking, well, how could you do that at the age of five? Well, some people are just blessed with a certain artistic genius and he was certainly one of those. Later in life, he writes one of the more famous operas, The Marriage of Figaro. And this, this opera, as well as so much in this era, deals with very important themes that are still relevant to us even to this day, things such as social injustice and the universality of human nature, that we, uh, human nature is basically the same for everyone. That's a very quick overview of music. We now want to look at literature and the intellectual developments that occur there. In this area, there's a systematic ex examination of society. And so they're comparing and contrasting the pessimistic views versus the optimistic views. And as you remember from earlier, they're both going on concurrently here. They're drawing very heavily, as some of these other artistic uh, uh, venues are, on a renewed interest in the classical culture. And by that, of course, we mean the Greco-Roman culture. And we see translations, themes, forms, references, all of these things where a scholarly element is coming into play as well. This leads to the English uh, Augustan movement. It imitated Roman Augustan poets, Augustan, of course, referring to the emperor of that day, and a return to order after 
the English Civil War, which had a huge impact on their particular society. One of the big players here is Alexander Pope. He was one of these Augustan poets. He dealt with the nature of human experience. He also borrowed from the Rococo in that, uh, or not, I shouldn't say it that way. He looked at the Rococo in a very satirical manner. And so he writes with a writing style that's very tinged with personal hostility. Um, they're not looking at the Rococo era with uh, great admiration, obviously. Interestingly, like many others, he's, there's this combination of both the Judeo-Christian heritage and the newborn humanist teachings, the idea that human beings are, uh, are, are worthy in of themselves to be considered on these things. And so a very, very human focus and emphasis, uh, uh, an emphasis rather there. And so there are things like the revelation of human folly. Um, again, this is a more pessimistic view here. Uh, folly is sometimes even epitomized as a woman. Uh, if you're thinking if that that's a little bit of a jab at women there, it certainly is. These are men that are doing this. And a reverence for order and reason. Alexander Pope was uh, wrote, laugh where we must, be candid where we can, but vindicate, vindicate rather the ways of God to man. So in his essay on man, he's dealing with some of these big issues that we still uh, deal with even today in terms of why things are the way they are, why human nature is the way it is. Another of the great satiric, uh, satiricists of this time, and one of the most famous of all time, is Jonathan Swift. He has a great hatred for the human race, and that may seem strange because you may think, well, isn't he himself a human? Um, he has a savage indignation for the abuses and the social injustice that he sees going on. Uh, he posits the idea that uh, we're just animals capable of reason. So in his great satirical work called Gulliver's Travels, there's a real satire of human behavior. By the way, there was a, a movie version of this made, I believe, in the early 60s that's well worth you checking out because the special effects are done by the great movie special effects pioneer Ray Harryhausen, who I greatly admire. And uh, it's, it's, it holds up very well, even to this day. His other well-known work is known as A Modest Proposal. It deals with topics like man's inhumanity to man and the inevitability of human suffering. If you do look at A Modest Proposal, prepare to be shocked. Uh, he's taking a very, very controversial theme here it wasn't even published during his life, lifetime. It was published later in um, after his death and uh, uh, after his death later. Uh, I'm sorry. I, again, this is unedited, folks. It was published during his lifetime, and that's what made it so controversial. Uh, but it was published anonymously. He wouldn't put his his name on it. Um, they were dealing with the famine in Ireland at that time, and he suggested. And again, he's not serious about this. It's it's based on satire that, well, they could solve their economic troubles by selling their children as food to the rich. And so this kind of hyperbole mocked the heartless attitudes uh, towards the poor, as well as the British policy uh, towards the Irish that the government had toward the poor. And so, again, that may seem outrageous to you, and, and it should, but he was, it was, it was tongue in cheek. It was, it was satire to describe uh, this very, very uh, oppressed uh, condition of the poor in uh, Ireland and in other places. This has become so famous over the years that in English writing, whenever you use the phrase, a modest proposal, it's now considered to be an allusion to this kind of style of very straight face, very blunt satire. Continuing in literature, we see the work of the rational humanist in the area of the encyclopedias. Now, no doubt today you're very 
familiar with encyclopedias. They're common out there, but these were new. And so these particular writers, like uh, Diderot, actually begin to collect and um, catalog human knowledge in these. And so there was a system, uh, an organized system for the classification of knowledge, a real compendium of human rationality. And this demonstrated the freedom of conscience and belief that these individuals had specifically their belief in the essential goodness of human nature and the possibility and maybe even the inevitability of progress. Here's a bust of Diderot done by the famous artist Udon, and you see the very calm, serene, intellectual look, and the artist captures that in his work. Continuing with the encyclopedist uh, Montesquieu, was another one. He advocated the distribution of governmental power. Uh, one very interesting uh, of the, and he's also considered one of the romantics of the time, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He held that humans were basically good, but it's, it was just society that's bad. And so he advocated and, and maybe even coined the term the noble savage, uh, that human beings left to themselves uh, are actually more noble that when we become so civilized. And so he has this real contempt for the superficial, for the artificial, and his belief in human equality. What your authors don't mention is that he also left a trail of, un, of, of uh, unwed mothers everywhere that he went. And of course, that being very irresponsible, you see the flaws in human beings like that. Voltaire was another individual. He wrote a number of works. Uh, he's sometimes called a man engaged. Uh, he's really engaged in these kinds of things. He's stressing the importance of freedom of thought. He frequently uses the word l'enfant in his works and the expression écraser l'enfant or crush the infamous because he's very cognizant of the fanaticism and the persecution of the common people out there by both the royalty and even the people in the, uh, in the churches, the clergy. Uh, and as he sees that, he's one of the first advocates of eliminating religion. Uh, he holds that it's all superstition and it leads to intolerance and it uh, breeds clergy that exploit people. And of course, we do see some of that even today. Uh, he felt that effect uh, when he was himself exiled uh, out of his home and out of his homeland and had to leave to escape persecution and the burning of his own books and many others. Um, and the hideous uh, sufferings of some of his uh, contemporaries. Um, one of his famous quotes was, quote, superstition sets the whole world in flames. Philosophy quenches them, unquote. So you see that he's not very, uh, very fond of organized religion. However, he does advocate natural religion and that a morality can flow out of that based upon something that has nothing to do with organized religion. Um, his, his primary work, or most famous work, is Candide. Uh, in it, he asserts the folly of unreasonable optimism, so he's more pessimistic than some of the others, and the cruelty and stupidity of the human race. So again, you see how these writers greatly disagree on a number of things, especially as it concerns optimism or pessimism towards humanity. And that leads these, these ideas to a, to a time of revolution. You know, again, this is the time of the birth of the United States and the French Revolution and many of these other things. This is brought about and actually helped by technological improvements, you know, the printing press, books, getting the word out. There's an increased literacy. More and more people can read now. There's a circulation of ideas. And all of these governmental abuses paved the way for this time of revolution. We mentioned earlier his son, Louis XV, used the term, après moi les 
deluge. Basically saying, after me, the flood will come. After me, the flood will come. He anticipated the great revolutions that were on the horizon. So that if the revolution ended his range, his reign, rather, the nation would be plunged into chaos. So he didn't care what happened after him. Uh, he, he knew that there was something you know, very ominous on the horizon there. This le led to the reign of terror in, um, in France in later years with uh, Robespierre, and it underscored the essentiality of constitutional government, which, of course, we all prefer today over the idea of a, uh, uh, of a monarch, even if it's an enlightened despot, as we talked about earlier. Also, we mentioned this was the time of the American Revolution. Uh, it was in some ways inspired by the revolution in France. But what your authors don't tell you is that in many ways it's not, in, in my opinion, influenced by the revolution in France. Notice how one revolution, quote unquote, if you want to call it a revolution, in, uh, resulted in a, in a constitutional republic and all of the uh, things that we enjoy in this country today, even though it's not perfect. But the revolution in France ended in total chaos and, and, and a, a bloodshed and, and a whole country that, that was just plunged into uh, disorder. And I hold that the reason for this is, is that the American so-called revolution was influenced by the Reformation movement, while the revolution in France here was more influenced by humanism. And I think there's a big difference between the two. You see, if you, if you draw upon the Reformation ideas, then you have something solid like the Bible to advocate that human beings should have intrinsic worth and dignity and value. Whereas in humanism, you have nothing rock solid that you can base that on. You have nothing that transcends just mere human opinion. So I think what many people don't realize today is, is that the freedoms that we take for granted and that we enjoy in this country, even though, once again, it's not perfect, is because it's very, very firmly rooted in a biblical tradition that sees human beings as the special creation of God. And as such, we are entitled to, as the Declaration of Independence says, we're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, meaning they're rights the government didn't give to them, so they can't take them away. It was God that gave us the rights to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if the government didn't give those to them, the government can't take them away. Once again, we see this articulated in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's very optimistic, again, because it has that Judeo-Christian foundation to it. Uh, so there is political and social freedom, equality and justice, and the universality of man and nature. Now, once again, I must stress, there is hypocrisy here, isn't there? Jefferson owned slaves. So equality and justice at this point in history was thought of in terms of free white males. That was inconsistent with the overall idea of equality and justice. But my point is, it eventually leads to the abolition of slavery, the doing away of slavery. It eventually leads to more rights for women and others that are not white males. Because if you live and think consistently with this Judeo-Christian ethic, you will eventually achieve these things. Now, agree or disagree with me on that, that's fine. That might make for a good discussion in the future. So, in another of Udon's work here uh, we, that we conclude with in this statue of Washington, or this sculpture, rather, of Washington, again, we see this promise of the democratic ideal, the constitutional republic, and the dignity of all human beings. That concludes chapter 16, part two. Thank you, and we'll see you next time for chapter 17.